Hello everybody and welcome to my start reading of the Alex Ryder books. Right, so, chapter one. Funeral voices. When the doorbell rings at three in the morning, it's never good, mu- good news. Alex Ryder was woken by the first chime. His eyes flicker open. Before a moment he stayed completely still in his bed, lying on his back with his head resting on the pillow. He heard a bedroom a door, bedroom door open and a creak of wood as somebody went downstairs. The bell rang a second time and he looked at the alarm clock glowing beside him. 3.02am. Uh, there was a rattling as, as someone slid the sec- security chain off the front door. He rolled out of bed and walked over to the open window. His bare feet pressing down the carpet pile. The moonlight spilled onto his chest and shoulders. Alex was 14, already or already well built, with the body of an athlete. Athlete, his hair cut short, apart from two thick strands hanging over his forehead, was fair. His eyes were brown and serious. For a moment, he stood silently, half hidden in the shadow, looking out. There was a police car parked outside from his second floor window. Alex could could see the black ID number on the roof and the caps of the two men who were standing in front of the door. The port light went on, went on, and at the same time the door opened. Miss Ryder? Miss, Miss, Miss Ryder? No, I am the housekeeper. What is it? What's happened? This is the home of Miss of Mr. Iron Rider. Yes. It, I wondered if we could come in, and Alex already knew. He knew from the way the police stood there. Oh, awkward and unhappy, but, but voices. But he also knew, he knew from the tone of their voices. Funeral voices. That was how he would describe them later. The sort of the sort of voices people use when they come to tell you that someone close to you has died. He went to his to his door and he and opened it. He could hear the two policemen talking down in the hall, but only some of the words reached him. A car accident. Call the ambulance. Intensive care. Nothing anyone could do. So sorry. It was only hours later, sitting in the kitchen, watching as the grey light of the morning of morning bled. Slowly through the West London street streets, that Alex could try to make sense of what had happened. His uncle to what had happened. His uncle, Iron Rider, was dead. Driving home, his car had been hit by a lorry at Old Street Round about, and he had been killed almost instantly. He hadn't been wearing a seatbelt. The police said. Otherwise, he might have had a chance. Chance. Alex thought of the man who had been his only relation for so, for as long as he could remember. He had never known his own parents. They had died in an accident. That one, a plane. Cr- that one, a plane crash. A f- crash a few weeks after he had been born. He had been brought up by his father's brother. Never, uncle. Never, never, uncle. Iron Rider had hated that word and had spent most of his 14 years in the same Terrance house in Chelsea, London, Chelsea, London, between the King's Road and the river. It was only now I had realised how little he knew about the man. A banker? People said Alex looked, Alex looked quite like him. Iron Rider was always travelling. A quiet private man who liked good wine, classical music, friends, classical music, any books, any books who didn't seem to have any girlfriends. In fact, he did, he didn't even have any friends at all. He had kept himself fit, had never smoked and he dressed expensively, but that wasn't enough. That wasn't a picture of a life. It was only a thumbnail sketch. Are you all right, Alex? A young woman had come into the room. She was in her late late twenties. 
twenty eyes with a sprawl of red hair and a round boyish face. Jack Star Starbright was American. She had come to London as a student seven years ago, rented a room in the house in return for light for light help for light house work and babysitting duties, and had stayed on to become a housekeeper and one of Alex's closest friends. Sometimes he wondered what the what the Jack was short for. Jackie. Jacqueline. Neither of them suited her. And although he had once asked, she had never said. Alex nodded. What do you think will happen? What do you mean? To the house? To me? To you? Mm. I don't know. She shrugged. I guess Iron will have made a will. He left instructions. Maybe we should look in his office. Yes, but not to yes, but not today, Alex. Let's take it one step at a time. Iron's office was a room running the full length of the house. High at the top, it was the only room that was always locked. Alex had only been in there three or four times, never on his own. When he was younger, he had fantasised that there might be something strange up there. A time machine or a UFO, but it was only an office with desks and a couple of filing cabinets, shelves full of papers and books. Bank stuff. That's what I had said. Even so, Alex wanted to go up there now, because it had never been allowed. The police said he wasn't wearing his seatbelt. Alex turned to look at Jack. She nodded. Yes, that's what they said. Doesn't that seem strange to you? You know how careful he was. He always wore his seatbelt. He couldn't even drive me around the corner without making me put mine on. Jack thought for a moment and shrugged. Yeah, it's strange, but that must have been the way it was. Why would the police have lied? The day dragged on. Alex hadn't gone to school, even though secretly he had wanted to. He would have preferred to escape back into normal life. The clang of the bell, the crowds of familiar faces. Instead of sitting there, trapped inside their house, we had to be there for the visitors who came throughout the morning and the rest of the afternoon. There were five of them, a solitaire solit solit who knew nothing about a will, but seemed to have been charged with organ organising with the, f the funeral. A funeral director who had a funeral director who had been recommended by a solicitor, a vicar, tall, elderly, elderly, who seemed disappointed that Alex didn't look more upset. A neighbour from across the road. How did she even even know that anyone had died? And finally, a man from the bank. All of us at the Royal and General are deeply shocked, he said. He was in the, he was in his thirties, wearing a pol, pol, polyester suit with a Marks and Spencer tie. He had the sort of face you forgot even while you were looking at it, and had introduced himself as Crawley from personal, from personnel. But if there's anything we can do, what ha what will happen? Alex asked for the second time in the d that day. You don't have to worry, Crawley said. The bank will take care of everything. That's my job. You'll leave me. You leave everything to me. Alex killed a couple of hours, e and in the evening playing with his PlayStation, and then felt vulgarly guilty when Jack caught him at it. But what else was he to do? Later on, she took him to a Burger King. To a Burger King. He was glad to get out of the house, but the two of them barely spoke. Alex assured Jack would have to go back to America. She couldn't. She couldn't. She certainly couldn't stay in London forever. So who would look after him? By law, he was still too young to look after himself. His whole future looked so uncertain that he preferred not to talk about it. He preferred not to talk at all. And then the day of the funeral arrived. And Alex found himself dressed in a dark jacket, preparing to leave in a black car that had come, that had come from nowhere. 
surrounded by people he had never met. Iron Rider was buried in the Brompton Cemetery. Cemetery. Cemetery on the Fulham Road. Just in the shadow of Chelsea Football Ground, and Alex knew where he would have to, where he would have preferred to be on that Wednesday afternoon. About thirty people had turned up, but he had he hardly recognised any of them. A grave had been dug close to the lane that ran the length of the cemetery, and as the service began, a black Rolls Royce drew up. The back door opened, and a man got out. Alex watched him as he walked forward and stopped. Overhead, a plane coming in to land at Heathrow momentarily blotted out of the sudden. Alex shivered. There was something about the new arrival that made his skin crawl. And yet the man was ordinary to look at. Grey suit, grey hair, grey lips and grey eyes. His face was expressionless. The eyes behind the square. Gun, gun mental spectacles, completely empty. Perhaps that was what disturbed Alex. Whoever this man was, he seemed to have less life than anyone in the cemetery. Above or below ground, she tapped Alex. Someone tapped Alex on the shoulder and turned round to see Mr Crawley leaning over him. That's Mr. Blunt, the personal manager whispered. That's Mr. Blunt, the personal manager whispered. He's the chain man of the bank. Alex's eyes travelled past Blunt and over to the Roy- Rolls Royce. Two more men had come with him. One of them was the driver. One of them, the driver. They were wearing identical suits, and although it wasn't a particular bright day, sunglasses. Both of them were watching the funeral with the same grim, fat, grim faces. Alex looked from them to Blunt and then to the other. People who had come to the cemetery. Had they really know, uh, known Iron Rider? Why had they never met any of them before? Why had he never met any of them before? And why did he find it so difficult to believe that any of them really worked for a bank? A good man, a, pro- a patriotic man... He will be missed. The vicar had finished his graveside address. His choice of his choice of words struck Alex as odd. Patri- patriotic, patriotic. That meant he loved his country, but as far as Alex knew, Iron Rider had barely spent any time in it. Certainly, he had never been one for waving the Union Jack. He looked. He looked round, hoping to to find Jack, but instead, in but but saw instead that Blunt was making his way towards him, stepping carefully round the grave. You must be Alex. The chain man was only a little taller than him, close to. His skin was made strangely unreal. It could have been made of plastic. My name is Alan Blunt, he said. Your uncle often spoke about you. That's funny, Alex said. He never mentioned you. The, the grey lips twitched, twitched briefly. We'll miss him. He was a good man. What was he good at? Alex asked. He never talked about his work. Suddenly, Crawley was there. Your uncle was, was overseas, overseas. Finace manager, Alex, he said. He was responsible for our forging branches. You must have known that. I know he travelled a lot, Alex said, and I know he was very careful about things like seatbelts. Well, sadly, he wasn't careful enough. Blunt's eyes magnified by the thick by the thick lenses lenses on of his spectac- spectacles, lasered into his own, and for a moment, Alex felt himself. Pinned down like an insect under a uh, microscope. I hope we'll meet again, Blunt went on. He tapped the side of his face with a single grey finger. Yes. (coughs) Then he turned and went back to his car. It was as he was getting into the 
Rolls Royce that has happened. The driver leaned across to open the back door and a jacket fell open, revealing the shirt underneath. And not just the shirt, the man was wearing a le- leather ho- holster with an automatic pistol strapped inside. Alex saw it, even as the man re- e- even as the man realising what had happened quick- quickly, straightened up and, and pulled the jacket across his chest. Blunt had seen it too. He turned back and looked again, again at Alex. Something very close to an emotion slithered over his face. Then he got into the car, the door closed, and he was gone. A gun at a funeral? Why? Why would a bank man, a bank man ages, ages carry guns? Let's get out of here. Suddenly, Jack was at his side. Cemeteries give me the creeps. Yes, and quite a few creeps have turned up. Alex muttered. They slipped away quietly and went home. The car that had taken them to the funeral was still waiting, but... They preferred the open air. The walk took them fifteen minutes as they turned the corner into the into the street. Into the street. Alex noted a remo- a removals van parked in front of the house. The words Stry- "striker" and "son" painted on its side. What's that doing? He began. At the same moment, the ba- van shut off. His wheels skidding over the surface of the road. Alex said nothing as Jack unlocked the door and let them in. Let them in. But while she went into the, into the kitchen to make some tea, he looked quickly round the house. A letter that had been on the hall table now lay on the carpet. A door that had been half open was now closed. Tiny detail, but Alex's eyes missed nothing. Somebody had been in the house. He was only sure of it. He wasn't certain until he got to the top floor. To the top floor. The door to the office, which has always been locked, was unlocked now. Alex opened it and went in. The room was empty. empty. I and Ryder had gone so, and so he so had everything else. The desk drawers, drawers, the cupboards, the shelves. Anything that might have told him about the dead man's work had been taken. Alex, Jack was calling to him from downstairs. Alex took one last look around the forbidden room, wondering again about, about the man who had once worked there. Then he closed the door and went down, back down there. Chapter 2. Heaven for Cars. For Cars. With Hammers, Hammers Smith Bridge just ahead of him, Alex left the river and swung his bike through the lights and down the hill towards Brookland School. The bike was a Condor Junior road racer, custom built for his own, for him on his twelfth, 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 twelfth birthday. It was a teenager's bike with a cut down Ray Reynolds five three one frame, but the wheels were full size, so he could ride it at speed with hardly any rolling resistance. He spun past a mini and a mini, and cut through the school gates. He would be sorry when he grew out of the bike. For two years now, it had been it had almost been part of him. He double locked it in the shed and went into the yard. Brookland was a new, comprehensive, red brick and glass, modern and ugly. Alex could have gone to any. To any of the smart private schools around Chelsea, but I and Ryder had decided to send him to send him here. He had said it would be more of a challenge. The first lesson of the day was math. When Alex came into the classroom, the teacher, Miss Donovan, was already scribbling on the whiteboard, setting a complicated equation. It was hot in the room. The sunlight streaming in through the floor to the ceiling windows, put in by architects. Who should have known better? As Alec took his place near the Mac, back he wondered how he was going to get through the lesson. How could he possibly think about algebra, algebra when there were so many other questions churn, churn, churning, churning through his mind? The gun and the funeral. The way Blunt had looked at him. The man with the striker and sun written on the side. But the empty was o- the empty office. 
and the biggest question of all, the one detail that had refused to go away, the seat belt. Iron Rider hadn't been wearing the seat belt? But of course he had. Iron Rider had been had never been one to give lectures. He had always said Alex should make up his own make up make up his own mind about things. But he'd had this thing about seat belts. The more Alex thought about it, the more less he believed it. A collision at a roundabout. Surely he wished he could he could see the car. At least the wreckage would tell him that the accident had really happened. That Iron Rider had Iron Rider really had died that way. Alex. Alex looked up and realized that everyone was staring at him. Mister Dono Donovan had just asked him something. He quickly scanned the whiteboard, taking in the figures. Yes, sir, he said. X equals 7 and Y is 15. The maths teacher sighed. Yes, Alex, you're absolutely right. But actually, I was just asking you to open the window. Somehow, he managed to get through the rest of the day. By the to- but by the time the final bell rang, his, his mind was made up. When everyone else streamed out, he made his way to the secretary's office and borrowed a local di- directory. What are you looking for? The secretary asked. Jane Bedford Shire was a young woman in her twenties. And she always had a soft spot for Alex. Breakers yards, Alex flicked through the pages. If a car got, car got smashed up near Old, Old Street, they'd take it somewhere nearby, wouldn't they? I suppose so. Here, Alex had found the yards listed under car dismantlers. There were dozens of them fighting for attention over four pages. Is this for a school project? The secretary asked. But she knew Alex had lost a relative. But not how. Sort of. Alex was reading the address, but they told him nothing. And the ones quite near. Old truth, Miss, Bedf- Miss, Miss Bedfordshire pointed at the corner of the page. Wait! Alex tucked the book towards him and looked at the entry underneath the one the, one the sec- secretary had chosen. J B J dot B dot dot striker, heaven for cars. J B J dot B dot striker, auto breakers, Lambeth Walk, London. Tell zero two zero seven one two three five three nine two. Call us today. That's in Vauxhall, Miss Bedford. Miss Bedfordshire said, not too far far from here. I know, but Alex had recognised the name. J dot B dot striker. He thought back to the van he had seen outside his house on the day of the funeral. Striker and son. Of course, it might have just been a coincidence, but it's still, still somewhere to start. He t- closed the book. I'll see you, Miss Bedfordshire. Be careful how you go. The secretary. The secretary. The secretary watched Alex leave, wondering why she had said that. Maybe it was her, his, his eyes, dark and serious. There was something dangerous there. Then the phone rang. And she forgot him as she went back to the work. J.B. Strikers was a square of wasteland behind the railway, railway tracks running out of Waterloo Station. The area was enclosed by high brick walls topped, topped with broken glass and razor wire. Two wooden gates hung open and from the other side of the road, Alex could see a shed with a security window and beyond it, beyond it the tottering piles of dead and broke cars. Everything of any value had been stripped away and only the rustling car cases remained heaped one on top of the other, waiting to be fed into the crusher. There was a guard sitting in the shed, reading the sun. Reading the sun. In the distance, a crane cuffed into life, then roared down on a battered Ford Mondeo, its metal claw smashing through the window to scoop up the vehicle and carry it away. A phone rang somewhere in the shed, and the guard turned round to answer it. That was enough for Alex, holding his bike and wheeling it along beside him. He sprinted through the gate. He found himself surrounded by dirt and debris. The smell of diesel was thick in the air. And the roar of the engine was deafening. 
Alex watches as the grain swoops on, on other on another cut of the cards, seizing it in it in a metallic grip, and dropped it into the crusher. For a moment, the car rested on a pair of shelves. Then the shelves lifted up, toppling the car over and down into a trowel. The operator sitting in the glass cabinet at one end of the crusher. Press the button. There was a great belt of black smoke. The shelves closed in on the car like a monster insect, folding it, folding in its wings. There was a grinding, grinding sound as the car was crushed until it was no bigger than a rolled-up carpet. Then the operator threw a gear and the car was squeezed out. Squeezed out. Metallic toothpaste being chopped up by a hidden blade. By a hidden blade. The slices tumbled on the ground, leaving the, his bright propped against the wall. Alex ran further into the yard, into the yard crouching down behind the wrecks with the, din, with the din from the machines. There was no chance that anyone would hear him, but he was still afraid of being, of being seen. He stopped to catch his breath, drawing a grimy hand across his face. His eyes were watery, watering from the diesel fume, diesel's fumes. The air was as filthy as the ground beneath him. He was beginning to re- to regret coming, but but then he saw it. His uncle's BMW was parked a few meters away, separated from the other car- other cars. At first glance, it looked absolutely fine. The metal, metallic, sil- silver body were not even scratched. Certainly, there was no way this car could have been involved in a fatal collision with a lorry or anything else. But it was his uncle's car. Alex recognised the number plate. He held closer, and it was then he saw the car was damaged. After all, the windscreen had been smashed along, with all the windows on one side. Alex made his way round the bonnet. He reached the other side and froze. I and Raya hadn't died in any accident. What had killed him was plain to see. Even someone who had never seen such a thing before. A spray of bullets had caught the car full on the driver's side. Sides shattering the front tyre, then smashing the windscreen and side windows and punching into the side panels. Alex ran his fingers over the holes. The metal felt cold against his flesh. He opened the door and looked inside. The front seat's pale grey leather was strewn with frag of broken glass and stained with patches of dark brown. He didn't need to ask what the stains were. He could see everything. The flash of the machine gun, the bullets rippling into the car, uh, the iron rider jerking in the driver's seat. But why? Why kill a bank manager? And why had the murder been covered up? It was the police who had brought the news, so they must be part of it. Had they deliberately lied? None of it made sense. You should have got rid of it two days ago. Do it now! The machines must have stopped for a moment. If there hadn't been a sudden lull, Alex would have never heard the men coming. Quickly, he looked across the city wheel and out the other side. There were two of them, two of them, both dressed in loose-fitting overalls. Alex had a feeling he'd seen them before at the funeral. One of them was the driver, the man he had seen with the gun. He was sure of it. Whoever they were, they were, they were only a few paces away from the car, talking in low voices. Another few steps, and they would be there. Without thinking, Alex threw himself into the only place available, inside the car itself. Using his foot, he hooked the door and closed it. And at the same time, he he became aware that the machines had started again, had started again, and he could no longer hear the men. He didn't dare look up. A shadow fell across the window as the two men passed, but then they were gone. He was safe. And then something hit the BMW, the BMW with such force that Alex cried out. His whole body caught here in a massive shock wave that tore him away from the steering wheel and threw him helplessly into the back. At the same time, the roof buckled and the three huge metal fingers tore through the skin of the car like a fork through an eggshell, trailing dust and sunlight. One of the fingers grazed the side of his head. Any closer, he would have been cracked. He would have cracked his skull. Alex yelled as blood trickled over his eyes. He tried to move, 
Then he was jerked back a second time as the car was yanked off the ground and tilted high up in the air. He couldn't see. He couldn't move. This t- but his stomach lurched as the car swung in a knock. The metal grinding and the light spinning air had been picked up by a co- by the crane. It was going to be p- p- going to be put inside the crusher. With him inside, he tried to raise himself up to punch through the windows, but the claw of the crane had already flattened the roof, pinning his left leg, perhaps even breaking it. He could feel nothing. He lifted a hand and managed to pound on the back window, but he couldn't break the glass. Even even if the workmen were staring at the BMW, they would never see anything moving inside. His short flight, he his short flight across the breaker's yard, ended with a bone shattering crash as the crane dis- deposited the car on the iron shelves of the crusher. Alex tried to fight back his sickness and despair and think of what to do. He had seen the car being process- processed only a few minutes before any moment. Now, the operator would send the car tipping into the coffin-shaped trowel. The machine was a leap, left foot sheer, a slow motion gill to nine. At the press of a button, the two wings would close on the car with a joint pressure on 500 tons. The car with Alex inside it would be crushed beyond recognition, and the broken metal and flesh would then be chopped into sections. Nobody would ever know, nobody would ever know what had happened. He tried with all his strength to free himself, but the roof was too low. His leg and part of his back were trapped, then, his, then the whole world tilted and he felt himself falling into darkness. The shelves had lifted, the BMW slid to one side and fell a few, a few metres into the trowel. Alex felt the metal work collapsing all around him. The back window exploded and glass showered around him, his head dust and diesel fumes punching into his nose and eyes. There was hardly any daylight now, but looking out of the back, he could see the huge steel head of the piston that would pu- that would push what was the left was left of the car through the exit hole on the other side. The engine tone on the of the left foot left leaf fort shears changed as it prepared for a final act. The metal wings shuddered. In a few seconds' time, the two of them would meet, crumbling the BMW like a paper bag. Alex pulled with all his strength, strength and. Ast- and astonished and astonished when his leg came free it took him perhaps a second one precise second to work out what had happened when the car had fallen into, into the trowel it landed on its side it had landed on its side the roof had buckled again enough to free him his hand scrabbled scrabbled for the door but of course that was useless the doors were too bent they had never opened the back window the glass gone he could glass gone he, he could crawl through the frame but only if he moved fast the wings began to move the bmw screamed as two wards of solid steel relentlessly crushed it glass shattered one of the wheel axes axle, axles snapped with the sound of a thunderbolt the darkness closed in alex grabbed the hold of what was left of the back seat Ahead of him, he could see a single triangle of light, shrinking faster and faster with all his strength. He surged forward, finding some sort of purchase purchase on the gear column. He could feel the weight of the two walls pressing down on him. Behind him, the car was no longer a car, but the fist of some hideous monster snatching at the insect that he had, that he had become. His shoulders passed through the triangle, out into the light, but his legs were still inside. If his foot snagged on something, he would be squeezed into pe- into pieces. Alex yelled out loud and jerked his knee forward. His legs came clear, then he then his feet. But at the last moment, his shoe caught on the closing triangle and disappeared back into the car. Alex imagined he had heard the sound of the leather being squashed, but that was impossible. Clinging into the back, oily surface of the of the ob- observation platform at the back of the crusher. He dragged himself clear and managed to stand up. He found himself face to face with a man so fat that he could barely fit into the small cabin of the crusher. The man's stomach was pressing against the glass, his shoulders squeezed into the corners. A cigarette da- a cigarette cigar- c- dangled on his lower lip and as as his mouth fell open and eyes and his eyes stared. In front of him was a boy in the rags of what had once been a school uniform. A whole sleeve had been torn off, 
and his arm, streaked with blood and oil, hung lip limply by his side. <coughs> by the time the the operator had taken had taken all this in, come to his senses and turned the machine off, Alex had gone. He clambered down the side of the crusher, landing on the one foot that had still had a sh- that still had a shoe. It was where now of pieces of pieces of jagged metal metal lying everywhere. If he wasn't careful, he would cut the other foot open. His bice- bicycle was where he had left it, leaning against the wall and gingerly half hopping. He made for it behind him. He had the cabin of the crusher open, and the round voice called it out. Raising the alarm. At the same time, a second man ran forward, stopping between Alex and his bike. It was the driver, the man had seen at the funeral. His face was twisted into, into a hostile frown, with curiously ugly, greasy hair, watery eyes, pale, lifeless skin. What do you think? he began. His hand slid into a jacket. Uh, Alex remembered the gun and instantly, without thinking, swung into action. He had started learning karate when he was six years old. One afternoon, with no explanation, I and Ryder had taken him to a local club for his first lesson. He had not been going there once a week ever since. Over the years, he had passed through the various KYU student grades, but it was only the year before that he had become a first grade. Dan, a black belt! When he had arrived at Brookland School, his looks and accent qu- and qu- had quickly brought him to the attention of, of the school bullies, the three hulking 16-year-olds. They had concerned him once behind the bike shed. The encounter had lasted less than a minute, and after it, one of the bullies had left Brookland, and the other two had never, have never troubled anyone again. Now Alex brought out up one leg, twisted his body round, and lashed out the back kick. Ashiro Jury is said to be the most lethal in karate. His foot powered into the man's ab- abdomen with such force that he didn't have to have time to cry out. His eyes bulged and his mouth, mouth half opened in surprise. Then, with his hand still halfway into the jacket, he crumbled to the ground. Alex jumped over, over him, snatched his bike and swung himself onto it. In the distance, a third man was running towards him. He heard the single word, stop, called out. Then there was a crack and a bullet whipped past. Alex, Alex gripped the hand, the handlebars and pedalled as hard as he could. The bike shot forward over the rubble and out through the gate. He took one look over his shoulder. Nobody had followed him. With one shoe on and one shoe off, his clothes in rags and his body streaked with blood and oil. Alex knew he must be a look. He must look a straight aside. But then he thought. Back to his last seconds inside the crusher and sighed with relief. He could have been looking a lot worse. Chapter chapter 3. Chapter 3. Royal and General. The bank rang the following day. This is John Crawley. Do you remember me? The personal manager at the Royal and General. We We were wondering if you could come in. Come in. Come in. Alex was half dressed, already late for school. This afternoon, we found some papers of your uncle, of your uh, of your uncle's. We need to talk to you about your own position. Was there something faintly threatening in the man's voice? What time this afternoon? Alex asked. Could you manage half past four? When we were on Liverpool Street, we can send a cab. I'll be there. Alex said, and I'll take the tube. He hung up. Who is that? Jack called out from the kitchen. He was cooking breakfast from, for the two of them. Although, how long had she, could she? How long he could remain with Alex was with Alex was with Alex was growing a little worry. Her wages hadn't been paid. Her she had o- she had only her own money to buy food and pay for the running of the house. Worse, still, her visa was about to expire. Soon she wouldn't even be allowed to stay in the country. That was the bank, Alex claimed into the room, wearing his spare uniform. He hadn't told her what had happened about the break- breaker's yard. He hadn't even told her about the empty office. Jack had enough on her mind. I'm going there this afternoon, he said. 
Do you don't do you want to come with to come? No, I'll be fine. He came out of Liverpool Street tube station just after the four fifteen that after that afternoon. Still wearing his school uniform, dark blue jacket, grey trousers, stick striped tie, he felt a bang easily enough. The Royal and General occupied a tall, antique-looking building with a, u- with a Union Jack, Union Jack, flutter, just look fluttering from a pole about fifteen floors up. There was a brass nameplate next to the main door, and a security camera swivelling slowly over the pavement. I stopped in front of it. For the moment. He wondered if he was making an escape mistake going in. If the bank bank had been responsible in some way for Iron Rider's death, maybe they had asked him here. He, they had asked him here to arrange his own. No, the bank wouldn't kill him. He didn't even have an account there. He went in, in an office on the seventeenth floor. The image of the security monitor flickered and changed as, as street camera. One smoothly cut across to recap, to re. Reception cameras two and three, and Alex passed from the brightness outside to the cool shadows of the interior. A man sitting behind a desk reached out and pressed the button, and the camera zoomed in until Alex's face filled the screen. So he came, and the chairman of the bank muttered, "That's the boy." The speaker was a middle-aged woman. She had she had a strange potato-shaped head, and her black hair looked as if as if it had been cut using a pair of blunt scissors and an upturned bow bow bowl. Her eyes were almost were almost black too. She was dressed in a ser- server a grey suit and she was sucking a peppermint. Are you sure about this, Alan? she asked. Alan blunt nodded nodded. Oh yes, quite sure. You know what to do. This last question was addressed to his driver, who was standing uncomfortably silently hunched over. His face was chalky white. He hadn't been like that ever since he had tried to stop Alex in the, light in the breaker's yard. Yes, sir, he said. Then do it, Blunt said. His eyes would never left the screen in reception. Alex had asked for John Crawley and was sitting on a leather sofa, vaguely wondering why so few people were going in and out. The reception area was wide and airy, airy with a brown marble floor. Three, elevi- uh, three elevators to one side and, above the desk, a row of clocks showing the time in every major world city, but it would have been the entrance to anywhere, a hospital, a concert hall, even a cruise liner. The plates had no identity of, it, of, its, own, of its own. One of the lifts pinged open and, the, and Crawley appeared in his usual suit, but with a different, t- different tie. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, Alex, he said. Have you come straight from school? Alex stood up, but he said nothing, allowing his uniform to answer the man's question. Let's go up to my office, Crawley said. He gestured, we'll take the lift. Alex didn't notice the force camera inside the lift, but then it was concealed on the other side of the two-way mirror that covered the black back wall. Nor did he see the thermal intensifier next to the camera. But the second machine both looked at him and threw him as he stood there, turning him into a pulsating mass of different colours, none of which translated into the cold seal of a hidden gun or a knife. In less than the time it took Alex to, Alex to blink, the machine had passed its information down to a computer which had instantly evaluated it and then sent its own signal back to the circuits a circuit to control the elevator. It's okay, it, he's unarmed. He's unarmed. Continue to the 15th floor. Here we are. Crawley smiled and ushered. Alex. Crawley smiled and ushered Alex out of the long corridor with an uncarpeted wooden floor and modern lighting. Lighting. A series of doors were punk, was punk, punk, punctuated by framing, frame, by framed pitch painting, paintings. Brightly coloured abstracts. My office is just along here. Crawley pointed the way. They had passed three doors when Alex stopped. Each door had a name plate, and this stopped, and this one he recognised. 1504, Iron Rider. White letters on black plastic. 
poorly nodded, nodded sadly. Yes, this is where your uncle was. It was much. He'll he'll be much missed. Can I go inside? Alex said. Alex said. Alex asked. Koi seemed surprised. Why do you want to do that? I'd be interested to see where he worked. I'm sorry, sorry, Corley sighed. The door will have been locked. I don't have the key. Another time, perhaps? He gestured again. He used his hat like a magician, as if he were about to produce a fan of cards. I have the office next door, just here. It went into 1505. It was a large square room with three windows looking out over the station. There was a flutter of red and blue out outside and Alex remembered the flag he had seen in the flagpole. He was right next to Crawley's office. Inside there was a desk and a, and a, cha- and a chair, a couple of sofas in the corner of the fridge and on the wall a couple of prints, a boring ex- executive office. Perfect for a boring executive. Please, Alex, sit down, Crawley said. He went over to the fr- fridge. Can I get you a drink? Do you have Coke? Yes, Crawley opened a can and filled a glass. Then he handed it to Alex. Ice? No, thanks. Alex took a sip. It wasn't Coke. It wasn't even Pepsi. It wasn't even Pepsi. He recognised the oversweet, slightly cloying cloy- taste of supermarket cola and wished he'd asked for water. So what do you want to, to, talk, to, me ab- to, to talk to me about your uncle's, your uncle's will? telephone rang and with another hand sign this one for this one for excuse me Corey answered it he spoke for a few moments then hung up again i'm very sorry alex alex i have to go back down to reception do you mind go ahead alex settled himself on the sofa i'll be about five minutes with a final nod of apology Corley left alex waited a few seconds then he poured the cola into a plotted plant and stood up. He went over to the door and back into the corridor. At the far end, a, worrying, a woman carrying a pile of papers at the far end uh, appeared and then disappeared through a door. There was no sign of Crawley. Quickly, Alex moved back to the door of 1504 and tried the, han- tried the, handle, tried the handle, but Crawley had been telling the truth. It was locked. Alex went back into Crawley's office. He would have given anything to have spent a few minutes alone in Iron, Rider, Iron Rider's office. Somebody thought the dead man's work was important enough to keep hidden from him. They had broken into his house and cleaned out everything they'd found in the office there. Perhaps the next room might tell him why. Why exactly had Iron Rider been involved in it? Involved in it? And what, what was it the reason why I'd been killed? The flag fluttered again, and seeing it, Alex went over to the window. The pole jutted over the building exactly halfway between the rooms, R- rooms 1504 and 1505. If he could somehow reach it, he should be able to jump onto the ledge that ran alongside of the building outside the room, outside room 1504. Of course he was 15 floors above. If he jumped and missed, there would be about 70, 70 metres to fall. It was a stupid idea. It wasn't even worth it wasn't even worth thinking about. Alex opened the window and climbed out. It was better not to think about it at all. He would just do it. After all, if this if this had been the ground floor or a climbing frame in the schoolyard, it would have been the child's play. It was it was only the sheer brick wall stretching down to the pavement, the cars and buses moving like toys so far below, and the blast of the wind against the face his face that made it terrifying. Don't think about it. Do it. Alex lowered himself to, onto the ledge outside Crawley's office. His hands were behind him, clutching onto the window sill. He took a deep breath and jumped. A camera was located in an office. Across the road caught Alex as he launched himself into space. Two floors above, Alan Blunt was sitting in front of the screen. He chuckled. It was a hum- humorless sound. I told you, he said. The boy's extraordinary. The boy's quite mad, the woman retorted. Well, maybe that's what we need. 
You're just going to sit here and watch him kill himself? I'm going to sit here and hope he survives. Alex had miscalculated the jump. He had missed the flag put by a centipede and it would have plunged down to the pavement as if his hand hadn't caught hold of the Union, ja- union Jack itself. He was hanging now with his feet in mid-air. Slowly, with huge effort, he pulled himself up, his fingers hooking into the material somehow. He managed to climb back up, up, up to the poor pole. He didn't look down. He just hoped that no passer, passerby but would look up. It would be easier after that. He squatted on the pole, then threw himself across to the ledge outside the Iron, Iron Rider's office. He had to be careful. Too far to the left and he would crash into the side of the building, but too far the other way and he would fall. In fact, he landed perfectly grabbing hold of the ledge with both hands and then pulling himself up until he was level with the window. It was only then he wondered if the window would be locked. If so, he'd just have to go back. It wasn't Alex. It wasn't. Alex slid the window open and hoisted himself into the second office, which was in many ways a carbon copy of the first. It had the same furniture, the same carpet, even a similar print on the wall. It went over to the desk and sat down. He went over to the desk and sat down. The first thing he saw was a photograph of himself. Taken the summer before on on the Caribbean island of Guadalupe, where he had gone diving. There was a second picture tucked into the corner of the frame. Alex, aged five or six, he was surprised by the photographs. He had never thought of Iron Glider as a sentimental man. Alex glanced at, the, at his watch. About three minutes had passed since Crawley had left the office, and he said he would be back in five. If, if he was going to find anything here, he had to find it quickly. He pulled open the drawer of the desk. It, it contained five or six thick files. Alex took them and opened them. He saw at once that they had nothing to do with banking. The first was marked Nerve Poisons, New Methods of Concealment and Dissemination. Alex put it aside, put, put, put it aside and looked at the second as, 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 assassination. Four case studies growing ever more puzzled. He quickly flicked through the rest of the files, which covered counter-terrorism and terrorism, the, mo- the movement of uranium across U- Europe and interrog- interrogation techniques. The last file was simply labelled Stormbreaker. Alex was about to read it when the door suddenly opened and two men walked in. One of them was Crawley, the other was the driver from the breaker's yard. Alex knew there was no point to, tr- to try to explain what he was doing. He was sitting behind the desk with the Stormbreaker file open in his hands. At the same time, he realised that the two men weren't surprised to see him there. From where they had come into the room, they had expected to find him. This isn't a bank, Alex said. Who are you? Was my uncle working for you? Did you kill him? So many questions, Crawley muttered. But I'm afraid we're not authorised to give you the answers. The, um, the other man lifted his hand and Alex saw that he was holding a gun. He stood up behind the desk, holding the file as if to protect himself. No, he began. The man fired. There was no explosions. The gun spat at Alex and he felt something slam into his heart. His hand opened and the fire tumbled to the ground. Then his legs buckled. The room twisted and he fell back into nothing. Right, everybody. That was the end of me reading you this book. My first time reading Alex Ryder book number one, which is called Stormbreaker. And we just realised there's a book called Stormbreaker. Okay, so bye-bye everyone and thank you for listening to this new Alex Ryder book that I've just heard about. Bye-bye, thanks for listening to this.